Welcome EMF Warriors to a mitochondrial presentation that we have for you here at uh, the EMF Warriors website slash mito, M-I-T-O. Um, here you will find the draw shop video that we have done and we are going to get into a deeper conversation about what goes on inside the mitochondria. I am here today, with, and I am Mr. Spock, of course. I am here today with <laughs> Jamie Ann Montiel. And Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you, Scott? Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to put this uh, presentation together for the public. It really dives into um, intersections between EMFs and the mitochondria, and it's probably a resource that you may not find anywhere else on the internet. So we are going to run through a presentation here of the mitochondria with the intersections of EMFs, and Jamie, go for it. Okay, so we're going to talk about how electromagnetic fields affect mitochondria. Anytime you have the movement of charged particles, you create an electromagnetic field. And so people don't realize that electromagnetism is the foundation of life. It's what controls biochemistry. So imagine going into a room where you hear every kind of music being played really loudly. I mean, you wouldn't be able to hear yourself think, right? And you probably wouldn't be able to communicate with other people. And so this is what our cells are experiencing when they're in high EMF environments. They can't function properly and they become very stressed. So energy is transduced into vibrations. Light waves and sound waves are converted into vibrations in the cell. And these vibrations alter molecular structure and function. So every cell, every organelle, every molecule, they resonate at certain frequencies. So mitochondria generate a field that's stronger than lightning. This is about 30 million volts per meter. The mitochondrial membrane potential is the result of the charge difference between the inner and the outer membrane. And this is about negative 140 millivolts. Yeah, the first time I realized that, uh, pretty, it was pretty shocking, right? Literally. <laughs> It blew me away when I realized how much inner, uh, electro, electric fields yeah, were on there. Yeah, it's confined in such a small space, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so where do mitochondria get their energy from? The natural EMFs found on Earth created life, and these energies are imprinted onto every living organism on this planet. Every organism is tuned to the native frequencies of the Earth and the sun. Yep. The, the native frequency of the Earth is Schumann, just so people know, is 7.83 hertz. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's octaves. That's right. Mm -hmm. So this is what's responsible for generating the mitochondria's uh, strong electromagnetic field. You have the uh, flow of electrons going through the electron transport chain, and you have the pumping of protons out of the matrix. And cellular water is also involved in creating coherence between neighboring mitochondria and other organelles as well. So artificial EMFs cause structural damage to mitochondria. They cause swelling, cavitations, and eventually the mitochondria begin to degenerate. And this happens in as little as a few hours. Man-made EMFs cause oxidation of the mitochondrial membrane and generate free radicals. Polyunsaturated fats, which are found in the membrane, are very prone to oxidation. Mitochondria also generate free radicals. However, it's only when it becomes too excessive that it causes damage. Artificial EMFs cause voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Remember how we talked about vibrations before? Well, EMFs can induce vibrations that can cause these channels to open. And EMFs can also cause the formation of pores and membranes. So this can allow toxins in, and it also affects the stability of the membrane. Calcium is an important signaling molecule that's involved in numerous cellular processes, everything from gene regulation to cell death. So mitochondria regulate calcium in the cell. Anything that increases intracellular calcium damages mitochondria. So free radicals are always looking to fill in the missing hole that, you know, from losing an electron. 
So it's going to cause a chain reaction. They're going to uh, steal from another molecule. That molecule is going to steal from another molecule, and it just keeps on going. But it's only when this becomes excessive does it cause oxidative stress. Yeah, I, I think it's important to also uh, point out here that ROS is the uh, reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. And there are many different forms of free radicals that can come in and, and create the damage, like perioxynitrite. Nitrite. Mm -hmm. And so cytochrome C oxidase is the terminal enzyme in the respiratory chain and that transfers electrons to oxygen to make water and ATP. And this enzyme is impaired by EMFs. These are just some free radicals. These are reactive oxygen species. Okay, we're gonna talk about mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is the most important genome. It's not the nuclear genome. And mitochondrial DNA can actually influence nuclear DNA expression. Yeah, Jamie, a really good point here is you're showing the circular form of the mitochondrial DNA. And a lot of people, when they think of DNA, they think of chromosomes and the bundling and the, you know, double, double helix. helix. Yeah. yeah. So, so here we've got the circular the portion and it's just, that's really important to keep in mind that uh, we've got these two sets inside our bodies. Mm -hmm. So mitochondria are easily damaged by oxidative stress caused by man-made EMFs. Mitochondrial DNA mutations can also further exacerbate oxidative stress. And so we've talked about a few things now, and you can see how they're all interrelated. So more mitochondrial DNA mutations lead to more defective mitochondria. And more defective mitochondria means more defective cells, right, Scott? Yep, that's right. Like the more... Uh more damage, more mutants you get into a particular cell within the mitochondria within the cell, the greater the chance you know, disease expression can take place. Um, this is a good example here, this slide of actually seeing that uh, it's represented like about 10 mitochondria in a cell, but in reality, there's in most cells, there's like hundreds or even thousands of mitochondria in a cell. So yeah. over time, when these become damaged, then you potentially have this disease expression taking place. Oxidative stress, when it's too great, can lead to cell death. When the mitochondrial membrane potential, which generates a strong electromagnetic field, is decreased for any reason, it signals pathways that lead to programmed cell death. So in summary, man-made EMFs cause multiple problems in the cell, and they're all interrelated, that, and they all accumulate in cell death. We really need to be mindful of our exposures to EMFs. Most of us are spending way too much time indoors. We're exposed to cell phones, Wi-Fi, smart meters, artificial light. We're not really meant to be indoors. We're meant to be outside like every other animal. Yeah, that's that's so true, Jamie. Also, the, the personal behaviors with your tech, like the inverse square law, um, will, like if you just even get like several feet away from certain technology, um, you'll be the intensity of the EMFs will go way, way, way down. So, like seeing a person with a cell phone up to their head or in their hand, they're getting like direct exposure to that to those non -native, non native EMFs or artificial man made EMFs. So, uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. Your your personal EMF hygiene really plays a role in today's modern world. Yes, when it comes to EMFs, distance is your friend. So the EMF spectrum just keeps growing and growing and growing because technology just keeps growing and growing. A really interesting point about this slide when people see it is they're looking at just the United States. Um, this is a worldwide thing where different uh, frequency bands are being bought out and uh, compete. There's a lot of competition among them. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars of competition. Yep. And so how do we repair our mitochondria? You need to ground or earth regularly. So you have to be barefoot on the earth or in the ocean. Daily sun exposure, morning, noon, and night. You get different kinds of light at different times of the day. In the morning, you get mostly infrared light. In the midday, you get a lot of UV. And in the evening, you get more infrared light again. Yeah, that's a great point. Also, what people should understand is it's it's quite 
important to also ground away from the power grid outside of your home. Uh, like a lot of people are trying grounding techniques um, and plugging in actually to the power grid, getting dirty electricity or stray voltage or other EMFs that are still inter intersecting them when they're trying to ground indoors. So if you, if you don't know your situation, it's just more safe to go out into nature. Okay, so you wanna avoid artificial light between sunset and sunrise. I use candles at night. I also use battery operated red lights. Yeah, and if we're in front of, uh, if we have to be in front of certain artificial lights, we like to use blue blockers that block out approximately yes. 400 to 550 nanometer light, as well as, um, like I'm like Jamie, I use battery powered lights for the DC effects so I don't get any flickering. Yes. And so uh, my glasses, they block uh, 550 nanometers and, uh, and lower. So I'm really blocking all the blue and some green actually too. You have a lot of color distortion, but you really need to block the blue light at night. You also need to get uh, adequate sleep and rest at night. You need to sleep in a room that's completely dark. You shouldn't be able to see the hand in front of your face. Your eyes are so sensitive that they can detect as little as one to two photons. Yeah, the, the really good point here too is when you sleep with your Wi-Fi router in your room or your, your mobile phone next to you, that is light coming into you. So do you want that light as well as uh, disturbing your sleep? Uh, you can think of it that some of the EMFs from that point of view. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the entire electromagnetic spectrum can be thought of in terms of physics. Uh, the only difference between, you know, the low frequencies and the really high frequencies is the wavelength, right? That's right. So we need to eat nutrient-dense foods and eat only during the daytime. Yeah, that's, this is what I do, which I've been doing for the last six years, as a matter of fact. I do typically intermittent fasting several times a week, and I'll stop eating like mid-afternoon just to like help crank up my autophagy and a little more bio, my mitochondrial biogenesis. That mm -hmm. uh, shows in some of the research that, that can, uh, you know, fasting can have an influence there if you, if you dig into that. Yeah. And if you notice, the past five points I talked about, they all relate to your circadian rhythm. You really need to normalize your circadian rhythm. And this is going to help you repair your mitochondria. Yeah, I was also going to mention to you, Jamie, on this one, is that when you're thinking of the repair and destruction of the mitochondria, in a lot of cases, these are long-term events. Like, you can't think of this in terms of just a few weeks or a few months. I mean, yeah. having, having a lifestyle of, of trying to you know, minimize the damage and increase the, the benefits to the mitochondria is really, you know, decades in the making. That's why a lot of disease expressions don't show up for like 10 or 20 years later. Yeah, this, these things have to be a part of your daily practice. You also need to drink plenty of spring water. Yeah, this is a really good um, EMF mitigator, just having your, your cytosol more kind of gel-like. This, this goes into some of Gerald Pollack's work with uh, exclusions on water. But when, when the water inside of you within your cells are more hydrated, you're going to be able to protect yourself against EMFs a little better. Yeah. I mean, water takes on information. The electromagnetic fields present on Earth, they're, they're imprinted onto water. So water is very important. Also, you need to exercise or play outside. You shouldn't be inside most of the time. That's right. And the light, the light mechanics go really deep here and, and beautifully because when you're playing outside and you're just in the sunlight, this actually helps to build that exclusions on water in your cells as well to yeah. give, you, give you that protection you need. Yeah, the red light and the infrared light, they help to build ex uh, exclusion zone. And last but not least, avoid or limit exposure to artificial EMF. <laughs> That's the tough one, right, Jamie? Yeah. <laughs> it is. I mean, we're surrounded by it everywhere we go nowadays. Yeah, like it's it's really important to more concentrate on what you can control in your local life with this because the environments you put yourself into, there are many things that can be done. Um, just understanding what exists there and you know, implementing more EMF hygiene will go a long way, but it, you can go down a rabbit hole trying to think of all the other stuff that is happening around us. And, it, you know, don't, don't go down the, the path of fear, <clears throat> go into like 
you know, conquering this, there's all these beneficial things that are right here on the slide that can be done to really help mitigate against our modern life. Yeah. Okay. So you just need to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the point. It's, that's it's the free. answer. That's basically the answer to mitigating, you know, EMFs is going outside. Yeah, it's time. Yeah, it's time spent. Like, like do do a little a little test. Like for one week, log the amount of time you spend indoors, and log the amount of time you get outside. Outside in, like having that sun even touching your skin, or getting into your body. Because a lot of people will get outside. They'll drive to work with their windows up, and that the windows like will block a lot of the UV and other wavelengths, and they really aren't getting the power of the sun at that point. Unless you're driving in a convertible, you know, with the top down, and, you know, but I don't count being, in, you know, inside a car as time spent outdoors. You really need to be outdoors, out in nature, you know, preferably at the beach. Uh, people don't realize that the beach, uh, the, the earth's field is strongest there, actually, because the waves and the ocean, they help um, create the earth's electromagnetic field. Yeah. That's right. Also, uh, when you're at a, at the beach, obviously you're going to have very little potential of artificial EMF impact um, at that location. I mean, it's true. Like even now, uh, I live here in Oregon, along the coastline, there are uh, different types of mobile phone towers and stuff that's being put up all over the place. But it's very rare you're going to get at the power grid close down near the ocean. So if you have access to the ocean, that's one great hack. Um, like here where I live at 5,000 feet, um, I can get more UVB when I need it, just have access to it as well. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done uh, depending on where you live. Yep. So thanks for having me, Scott. Yeah, Jamie, thanks for putting this together and uh, continue to look <clears throat> on this page in the future for other updates with mitochondrial function and intersections to EMFs. All right. Thanks again, Jamie. Thanks. Bye. Bye.